Thank you, Alina. Thank you, Alina. Thanks for inviting me. So yes, I'm going to speak about uh, points, lines, and polynomial identities. It's a team that uh, connects combinatorics with algebra, algebraic geometry, and uh, important problems in theoretical computer science. Okay, so let me start. So, okay, yeah. So yeah, what I'm going to speak about is the about the main problem is going to be the sylvester gray theorem and some relatives of this theorem. I'll speak about applications. So usually I speak about two applications, locally correctable codes and algebraic identity testing. I think that now I will have time only to speak about the second, but if there was time without questions, I'd be happy to also mention locally correctable codes. So these are the applications of the Sylvester Light theorem. And then I speak about higher degree analogs, new results, and I give a sketch of the proof. Okay, so point line incidences. This is a, a main theme, in, uh, it's an important uh, subfield in uh, discrete uh, geometry and combinatorics. Basically, the questions look like the following. They are given collections of points and lines satisfying certain properties. And then we have to bound some combinatorial measure related to these uh, arrangements. For example, the number of point line incidences or the number of lines satisfying certain properties, the number of points, etc. And there are many famous results and conjectures uh, related to this thing, like the Samaradi Total Theorem, the Good Cuts Theorem, the Kakea problem, etc. etc. So, this is a very active area with many beautiful open problems and known theories. In this talk, I'll speak about the Sylvester Light Theorem and some uh, closely related uh, uh, questions and uh, problems. Okay, so the Sylvester Light Theorem is an interesting uh, history. It was conjectured by Sylvester in 1893, then independently by Erdes in 1943. It was proved by Melchior in 1941, and then by Gala in 1944, and then it's, it's called the Sylvester Light Theorem. Uh, yeah, so the theorem says the following you're, you're given a set of points in a R square, a finite set of points, and the points satisfy the following interesting property that any line to any two points in the set meets a third point in the set. So for example, take this line, passes through two points, and it meets the set in the third point. This line has the same property, this line has the same property, etc. So if all the lines satisfy this property, then the theorem says that the points must be collinear. Okay, certainly a collinear sort of point satisfies this property, but this is if and if. And indeed, in the example, there's a line that passes through exactly two points. Okay, so that's the Sylvester Wright theorem. Any finite collection of points such that any line that passes through two of them meets the setting of third point must be correct. So let me show you the proof because it's very short and very elegant. So let's call, uh, consider the, uh, the point in the line uh, where the line passes through at least two points from the set. And let us pick the point in the line so that the distance between them is the smallest. So here's the line, here's the point, and let's say that the distance is D. Now, by, by the assumption on the set, there must be three points on the line. So at least two of them uh, must be two on the one side of the meeting point of this perpendicular to the line. And now, if you just look at this line, then you get a smaller distance in contradiction to the way that you chose P in the line. So that's it. That's the proof. It was open for 40 years, but uh, and the first proof by Melchior was, I mean, uses, used heavy tools, but this is a really beautiful and elegant tool, probably most of you have seen already. Um, and just notice a few things. First of all, it's important that P is finite because otherwise you could just take the entire plane. Another thing is that it's not, it, it can be, it's, it also holds of a higher dimensions, but you can, you can just project your points to dimensions. Right, and uh, we also use the reals, right? We use distances. Uh, which is property of the reals. Uh, it's not, it doesn't hold over finite fields, and indeed it's not one of finite fields. And also the proof does not work over the complex numbers. So indeed it was conjectured by Sir in uh, 66, and then proved by Kelly in 86, that if we take the same assumption that any complex line, 22 points, it's a certain at third point, then in this case, the dimension of the affine span of the points can be two. It's no longer one, it can be two as, so it's like the, uh, uh, the C square. It's not R square, it's like C square, right? So, okay, so that was proved by Kelly. 
another uh, important uh, version that is related to what I'm going to speak about later is the colorful version of the theorem uh, due to Edelstein and Kelly that for us will only focus on the following uh, uh, statement. So let us assume that our set P is composed of three different colors, uh, three different sets. One is the red set, then we have the green set and the blue sets. Another property is that every non-monochromatic line must contain all three colors. So for example, if you pick a red point and the blue point and take the line that connects them, then this line also meets the green set in some point. Then the conclusion is that the dimension of the affine spine is at most three, uh, and, uh, and over the, the complex number, actually you lose one more in dimension. I forgot to write it. And another uh, version of this theorem that you're going to need or use is the following robust version. So up till now, we assume that every line to any two points satisfies some property. And uh, a decade ago, Barak, Dirk, Wittelson, and Udariof, and later Wittelson and Wittelson, uh, strengthened the result, proved the following robust version, that if you pick any point in the set and you look at the special lines, special lines are the lines that contain three points from the set, then this line covers some constant fraction of the set, like 10% of the set. So it's no longer that any line that passes through two points meets the setting third point, but like many lines. Then the conclusion is that the dimension of the span is at most uh, O of one over delta. It's a constant over delta. And this is tight because right, you can take, we can partition the set to, uh, if we have n points, we can take n over delta n points in one over delta in different directions. And this will start, it's not how to show that this will satisfy the property. So after a constant factor, this result is tight, which is uh, very nice. And actually, as it turns out, using the same tools as they used to prove this result, you can reprove a uh, Kelly's theorem over the complex number. Okay, so these are three different versions of the uh, sylvester Gray theorem and some extensions of it. Now I'm going to, I want to connect it to problems on polynomials. So let me take a, a, an algebraic view of this theorem. Uh, it can also be viewed as a dual resizing of the theorem. Okay. So in this setting, we have a finite set of homogeneous linear equations over the bits. So we have like n variables and n linear equations, homogeneous linear equations. And they satisfy the following property that whenever we take a, a common zero to two of the linear equations, then they are also a zero of some third equation. Okay, so any, any uh, n tuple that makes two of the linear equations uh, vanish or two or be satisfied also makes the third equation uh, equal to zero. And in this case, you can show that uh, the dimension of the affine of the span of the linear functions is at most two or over the complex number, you lose one more in dimension. Okay, so this is not about points of line, it's about linear equations and the set of zeros, about hyperspaces. Uh, okay, so let me just give you the one line proof of this basically. So if you consider a linear equation L, which is of the form of V uh, in a product with the, the uh, variable vector X, then you can associate with L the, the span of V, the one dimensional line to V. And now pick a hyperplane in general position, and for each linear equation L, uh, associate the point where, uh, of the intersection of the span of V with this hyperplane. And now it is not difficult to prove that if a line if a linear equation is in the sense to other linear equations, then those three points must be collinear. And the, this co uh, condition about the vanishing, of course, implies that uh, for any two linear, func linear equations, some third equation is in the linear span. Okay, so this is a, a one dimensional uh, analog of the Sylvester Gallai P1. And uh, I'm going to speak about higher degree analogs uh, uh, during this talk. Okay, so let me now show you why this problem, how it connects to uh, problems in theoretical computer science and how I got interested in it. Uh, and then I will show you about, I mean, I'll speak about the higher degree analogs and the relevant to uh, polynomial identity testing of general circuit classes or more general circuit classes. Okay, so I'm, I don't expect you to know this topic. I'll define everything and explain it. Okay, so. A big thing in computer science is the question of program testing. And in this talk, I'll only consider algebraic programs. So what's an algebraic program? Just imagine that you get, you have a set of variables and you're allowed to use uh, 
additions, multiplications, and also use uh, scalars from some, uh, some underlying field F. Now somebody asks you to compute some algebraic expression. For example, consider the polynomial X square minus Y square. So you give this problem to your students and they come up with some implementation. And they give you some other, some you know, program that they claim computes what you wanted them to compute. Now the question is, how do you verify it? How do you make sure that these two equations are equal? Right, and this is a very general problem. Right? Think about chips designed by Intel. They're supposed to do multiplication of like large numbers. How do you verify that they work correctly? Right, so this is a very important uh, software uh, and out of problem. But this is not just a problem about programming testing, right? I mean, in mathematics, you have many algebraic identities. For example, this determinant of the van der Monde, right? It's like this product. And so how can we verify such identities efficiently? Well, in the case of this determinant, of course, we have a proof, but there are many general identities, many conjectural identities that we don't know how to prove. And the problem is that if we try to expand both sides, then they have exponentially many monomials. So we don't have an efficient way of you know, checking that everything I mean, cancels out or that the, the two expressions are equal, right? Because we just take too much time. Even if you have only 50 variables, then you can have two to the 50 many monomials. It's like a huge number, right? And there are numerous such identities. And the, and the general problem that I'm thinking about and that interests me is the following. We are given an algebraic computation. So by that, I mean, it has to be an efficient computation. You have like, it's like something like that, like the product x i minus x j, right? Something that you can present in a short and succinct way. And you have to determine whether it computes the zero polynomial. Oh, yeah. as differently, you can have two expressions, f and g, both uh, given by efficient computation, and you have to check whether they compute the same polynomial. So if you take the difference, then it's the question about being zero. Okay, so this is the general question of polynomial identity testing or checking algebraic identities. And of course, I think it's a very natural question and uh, um, it has many applications in computer science, but let me first uh, define it uh, properly. So the model of computation that we are talking about is called uh, algebraic circuit. So an algebraic circuit, you can think about it as a, an acyclic graph, a cyclic directed graph. Okay, so we have inputs. Inputs are vertices of degree zero. And the inputs are labeled by other, either variables or scalars from the field. Then we have the internal gates. The internal gates are labeled with the arithmetic operations, multiplication and, and, and additions. And uh, each gate computes a polynomial in the very natural way, right? For example, this gate computes x1 times x2. The plus gate here computes x2 plus one, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so each gate computes a polynomial. So the challenge is that given such a circuit, so now think about it as having many, many variables, like 500 variables, like n variables, with n is large. I mean, think about n asymptotically going to infinity. And the computation is also uh, polynomial in n, like say of size n squared. So it has many monomials, it's a complicated expression, and you have to decide whether it computes a zero polynomial. Okay, so that's the basic uh, polynomial identity testing question. And you can see that immediately relates to checking algebraic identities, right? It's just efficient or succinctly represented identities. So there's a very simple randomized algorithm, right? In the, of course, it's, it dates way back, but in the computer science literature, it usually uh, uh, attributed to the middle Lipton, Zippel and Schwarz, but of course, it was done for many years before that. And the algorithm is simply just evaluate your circuit at a random point, right? And it's, because the very, the, the very simple fact is that if the polynomial is not zero, then it's not zero with high probability, right? It's like the set of zeros is measured as measure zero. Okay, but what we are asking is not for a randomized algorithm. We want a proof, right? We want to know that the identity is Okay, we want a deterministic algorithm, not an algorithm that outputs the correct answer with high probability, but that always outputs the correct answer. And this is, I mean, okay, I think that this is a very natural problem on its own, but also motivated by other problems in computer science or in mathematics. So for example, the celebrated primality testing algorithm 
of agroal kernel in Saxena works by solving a certain polynomial identity deterministically. Uh, from the computer science per, uh, perspective, there's a, uh, I will not go into it if you don't know it, there's uh, the problem of deciding whether a graph has a perfect matching. So we have sufficient algorithms for, for that problem, but the only uh, parallel algorithm, I mean, an algorithm that can make many steps at the same time, but you ask how many sequential steps in it is, the best parallel algorithm here is randomized. And if you could solve the polynomial identity testing problem efficiently, then you would get a deterministic parallel algorithm. But perhaps the most important application is that the PAT problem, the polynomial identity testing problem, is intimately connected to the algebraic version of the P versus NP problem. And it's not exactly what's written here, but basically, or morally, uh, solving PAT is almost equivalent to deciding whether P equals to NP in the algebraic world. Okay, so you not define P or no NP in the algebraic world, but there's, these are well-defined classes, and that's a very important problem. And if you want me, I can explain it to the end. Uh, and this collection was uh, shown by Kabbalah Simi in uh, 2003. Okay, so I hope that right now the problem statement is clear, right? We have an algebraic computation. We have to decide whether it computes a zero polynomial. And uh, we have to want to do it deterministically and efficiently. And I hope that I also convinced you that this is a, well, a very natural and interesting problem but, uh, on its own, but it's also important for uh, other uh, reasons. Uh, so I think it's a good time for questions, if there are any. Okay, so let me continue. So let me uh, consider a very special example of polynomial identity testing. I'm going to look at a very uh, uh, restricted class of computation that's called sigma pi sigma. So let's ignore for this three for now. So what does sigma pi sigma stand for? We're going to take sums, this is sigma, of products of sums. So this less sum computes well, a linear function. Then we have products of linear functions, and then sums of products of linear functions. For example, consider the following polynomial. Take the product, i runs from one to d, of certain you know, linear polynomials, another product, another product. So we have like three multiplication gates. This is the three here. And we ask, does this sum equal zero? So, uh, and here omega is like a root, a, a deep root of unity. Okay, so, uh, well, it's not, how to, it's not so easy to see perhaps, but, like, but this is a, a cooked uh, example. And if you do the following change of variables and you play with it a little bit, then this simplifies to the following uh, simple expression, uh, which is easily seen to be simple. But well, just, just compare these two expressions. This expression looks somewhat mysterious. This is a very simple expression. And I derive to it by a simple change of variables. Okay, but of course, this is some example that I prepared at home in class. So the general question is the following. I'm giving you such an expression, like a high degree expression that has linear functions in n variables. And ask you, does it compute a zero polynomial? Now, if you try to expand the expression when you have n variables, then Roughly, you're going to get something like n to the d many monomials. And if d is large, and this is going to be an exponential number, and you're not going to be able to handle it efficiently. So is there a better way of checking whether such identities are zero or not? So that's a, a, one motive. I mean, that's the first question of the Sinatra like theorem came to play in the polynomial identity testing uh, uh, some, uh, setting. OK. So let me show this connection. So let's look at the general question. We have uh, A, B, and C. A is the product of linear functions. B is the product of linear functions. And C is the product of linear functions. So A, B, and C are all linear functions over the wheels. But you can also consider them over the complex numbers. It's not really important. And you have to decide whether A plus B plus C equals 0. Right? It's exactly an expression like we had before, but now written in a general form. Uh, and notice that this is the first and trivial case because if you had only a, whether if you had to decide whether a plus b is zero, then by unique factoring, this is pretty easy. You just have to check that there's a matching between the linear functions in a and b and that the constants agree, and, and basically that's it. So a plus b plus c is the first non trivial example. And it's already a, a, a bit non trivial. Um, so in a joint work, we show that uh, if the sets are disjoint, so no linear function appears in two sets, 
And notice that we can make this assumption without loss of generality because if the sum is zero, a linear function appears both in A and B, then it must also appear in C, so you can divide by this linear function. So if the sets are disjoint and be satisfied that their sum is zero, then if you look at the span of all the linear functions, all the three sets, it is bounded by some uh, absolute constant. So this absolute constant is independent of the number of variables and the degree of the circuit. Okay? So yes, yeah, so that's an interesting setting. Whenever you have a product, three product of linear functions that sum to zero of arbitrary degree in arbitrarily many variables, essentially the situation is not so different from the example that we showed here, where you basically have like three variables and things have to cancel out some in a magic way. Okay, so that's the, I mean, the take home message of this theorem. And how do you prove it? Well, it's very simple once you make the connection to the semester right theorem or to its colorful variant. So, okay, let me first say that how do you get an algorithm for it. Well, if the dimension is constant, then you can just make a change of variables to get any, an expression in, in a few variables, and then expanding is not so uh, costly. So, it just you do it in polynomial time. Okay, so how do you prove this uh, statement? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Consider assuming that you assume that you have such an equation a plus b plus c equals zero. Take any linear function from A and any linear function from B and set them to zero. Then certainly A vanishes, right? Because you set A to zero and B vanishes because you set BJ to zero. So if your sum is zero, then C must also vanish. And this means that whenever A and BJ vanish, then so, so does some other polynomial from C, other linear function from C. And if you think of it about it for a second, since they deal determined by A and BG is prime, right? The set of zero, I mean, the ideal uh, generated by A and BG is prime. It means there's a unique, or at least one secret that always vanishes whenever A and, and oh, sorry, whenever A and BJ vanish. And this is exactly the situation of the colorful version of this investor guy, right? We have like three sets, three colors, right? A, B, and C. Whenever you took, take two linear equations from two different color sets and you set them to zero, some equation from the third set becomes zero. And now you can apply the algebraic version of the edelstein kelly theorem, which is the colorful version of the semester like theorem, to conclude that the dimensions. Okay, so I hope that this connection is clear and simple. Okay, the, uh, and this approach actually extends when you have more than three summons, or you have a, a, like any number of, any constantly, constant number of summons. Uh, this was done by Eka and so uh, And uh, why is it interesting? So, okay, so I'm, I wanted to speak about the general polynomial identity question, and I spoke only about a very restricted model of sums of products of linear functions. But as it turns out, this model is quite strong. And in, in particular, if you could solve the polynomial identity testing problem for that three seconds, for such sigma pi sigma series, but of exponential degree, so of very, very high degree, then this would imply an algorithm for the general case. Okay, I'm not going to speak about this reduction, but that's a very interesting result. It shows that this polynomial identity testing problem, actually you just have to solve it for a very, very restricted class of computations, sums of product to final functions. So I think that's already a very appealing uh, uh, property of this uh, single pi single model. Okay, so this was that three single pi sigma law and the uh, for this, we only needed to use the, the linear algebra, the degree one analog of the semester right theorem. So now let's look at the more general model of depth four circuits, which are now sums of products of sum of products. So this uh, sum of products computes a polynomial with, with a few monomials. So if you want the computation to be efficient or if, like polynomially many gates in the circuit, and this is going to be a polynomial on n variables on n variables it only polynomially many monomials, and we have products of such polynomials and sums of products of such polynomials. And let us, so let us look at the following uh, specific question. Again, we have uh, A, B, and C. Each A, I, B, I, and C, I is a degree D polynomial. And you have to decide whether the sum is zero. Okay. So earlier we saw the case of linear functions, so D was equal to one. Now we are asking a more general question. 
And this model is very interesting because here, I mean, earlier in the depth three case, we had to study PAT for exponential degree in order to get results for general circuits. Now there's a theorem of Agarwal and Vinay that shows that it's enough to solve it for uh, uh, PAT for depth four circuits to get PAT for general circuits. So you don't have to go to exponential degrees. Also, polynomial size depth four is enough. Okay, so that's a very important model. Uh, it's been heavily studied ever since this uh, result. And uh, it was conjectured by uh, Bikken, Mittman, and Saxena, uh, and by Gupta that, okay, so it's a slightly different sort of conjectures. I'll speak more about the conjectures of Gupta later. That if you have such an expression that sums to zero, then if you look at the algebraic rank, not a, a linear standard, but the algebraic rank of all the polynomials in our three sets, then it's again some absolute constant that only depends on D, not on the number of variables nor the number of uh, multiplicants in each rate. Okay, so not in the degree of capital A or capital B or capital C, nor on the number of variables. It's an absolute constant. It only depends on P. Okay, and uh, what's the intuition? Of course, the intuition goes back to the degree one case that we saw earlier. And again, the intuition is the following, that if you set two polynomials to zero, so A vanishes and B vanishes, and therefore C must vanish, and for every common zero of A and BJ, there is some K that also vanishes. So the intuition says that, well, we just need some degree D analog of the edelstein kelly theorem. I mean, the colorful version of the sylvester gray theorem. <coughs> but just know that this case is different than the uh, linear algebraic case because the ideal generated by A and BJ uh, does not have to be prime. And for example, consider the following simple example. Consider the polynomial A, which is xy plus c times w, and B, which is xy minus c times w. Now, and, uh, and also consider C, which is going to be a product of four linear polynomials. Now, it's not hard to see that whenever A and B vanish, then you know, xy must vanish, and z times w must vanish, and therefore one of them must vanish. But it doesn't always have to be the same ci. Right? For different zeros of A and B, there are going to be different CIs of vanish. It's not always going to be the same one. So it's a different problem. It's not, you have to chase the CK. It's not always the same fixed CK. Okay, so this makes this problem uh, harder uh, uh, to solve. And this is just one aspect of this uh, hardness, this new difficulty. Okay. So any questions so far? Uh, okay, good. So let me speak about our results. And these are results, uh, uh, some of them are joined with my student, uh, Shir Peleg. Okay, so uh, the first set, uh, set of results speaks about the setting of quadratic polynomials. And it says the following. So if this set satisfies that for every two polynomials, there's a third polynomial that finishes whenever the first two vanish, then again, we get that the dimension of the span of the AIs is again some absolute constant that is not dependent on the number of polynomials or the number of variables. Okay? And notice the conjectures talk about algebraic rank. You again get some linear bank. Okay? So this also is also true for quadratic polynomials. And uh, remember, we also wanted colorful versions of this theorem. So there's also a colorful version that again, if A is partitioned to three sets, R, G, and B, such that whenever two polynomials from two color sets vanish, some polynomial from the third color set vanish, then again, the dimension is constant. And uh, recently, uh, two uh, different works, independent works, uh, we proved this, uh, the first work is with my student, and uh, there was uh, another independent work by Gargo, Golizera and Snugupta that proved the robust version. And again, what's the robust version? That basically, uh, Okay, so the following, okay, uh, no, okay. So the robust version says that for, let's consider any polynomial in the set R, then uh, for a delta fraction of the polynomials in the set green, there is a polynomial in the set blue, such that whenever AI and, you know, BI vanish, BJ vanish, and so does the blue polynomial vanishes, et cetera. So now it's not that for every AI and BJ, but rather for, for every AI, a delta fraction of the other sets satisfies something, uh, uh, then you get, again, that the dimension is bounded by some polynomial in one of them. Okay, and uh, now another version that 
Okay, so these two versions both model for every A and AJ, there is a unique AK. In a, a different transit shear, we prove that if you have the property that whenever, whenever A and AJ vanish, then the product of all the other polynomials vanishes. So it's not always the same polynomial, right? It's like the example that we showed earlier. Then also in this case, the dimension is bounded by some absolute constant independent of the number of variables or the number of polynomials. So this is basically what you wanted to achieve for uh, uh, quadratic polynomials, except that uh, we don't have the colorful version in this case, uh, which is what we need to get polynomial identity testing. Uh, so consider the following setting. Now we have three sets of three sets of quadratic polynomials and A, B, and C. And again, in a different work, we prove that if we set sum to zero and they are disjoint, again, in terms of generality, then the dimension is again constant, okay? And this implies a, a polynomial time PT algorithm for the sums of product of sums of degree two polynomial, right? So some, this two layers of sums and product compute quadratic polynomials. So this is like sums of product of quadratic polynomials and we have three sums. Okay, so that was the first polynomial time algorithm for a model that contained uh, polynomials of degree higher than one, okay? So this is basically the results that I've been involved in in uh, this line of research. Um, and uh, a couple of new results that are still not published, so I'm not going to speak about it, but that generalize some of the results here. Uh, so it's not mine, so I let, I mean, I'll not speak about these results. Um, okay, so let me just give maybe a few words about uh, how we prove these results. So there are two main ingredients. The first of them is some uh, algebraic structure theorem uh, that studies uh, ideas generated by two quadratic polynomials. And the theorem says the following. So I had a version in my first paper and then we extended it each year to a modular setting. And it says the following. So assume that you have two polynomials Q1 and Q2 and a set of some other polynomial, quadratic polynomials Pi. And it's a property that every common zero of Q1 and Q2 is a zero of one of the PIs, right? So whenever Q1 and Q2 vanish, then the product of PI also vanishes. Right? This is like what happens in the, you know, in many in, in like in the uh, in the in the first in, in this example or in this example where we have colored the sets. Okay. Then the theorem says that one of the following uh, things must happen. Okay, either there is some PI in the linear span of Q1 and Q2. So certainly if, if such a pi exists and whenever q1 and q2 vanish, then that pi vanishes as well, and therefore the product vanishes. Okay, so that's like one trivial case. However, another possible case is that there exist two linear functions, let's call them L and L prime, such that the product is in the span of q1 and q2. Okay, I'll show an example of this case uh, soon. And the third possible case is that there are two linear functions such as q1 and q2, are uh, zero modulo them, or in other words, that Q1 and Q2 belong to the ideal uh, generated by L and L. Okay, so it even says that whenever you have this case, that whenever Q1 and Q2 vanish, some product of quadratic polynomial vanishes, then one of these two cases must happen. So if you think about it, condition one is like the generic case, but right? if Q1 and Q2 start, no, don't satisfy any relation among them, then basically case one tells you that the only way that such a thing can happen is if some polynomial is in the linear span. Then the two other cases uh, speak about possible structure that, or possible relations in Q1 and Q2 when you are very far from being in the generic case. Okay, so let me give you just examples showing that these three cases are different. So certainly the first case does not need any explanations. Let's look at an example for the second case. So for example, let Q1 be some product polynomial, and Q2 be Q1 plus L times L prime. Now just let P1 and P2 be the following two polynomials, pick two other linear functions, L1 and L2, and define P1 to be like Q1 plus L times L1, and P2 to be Q1 plus L prime times L2. And now observe that whenever Q1 and Q2 vanish, then also this product vanishes, L times L prime vanishes, so either L vanishes or L prime vanishes, and then it's not all to see it. This immediately implies that either P1 vanishes or P2 vanishes. Or in other words, that P1 times P2 always vanishes. 
And again, it's not how to see that P1, no P2, are in, not, they are not in the linear span of Q1 and Q2. Okay, so this case is different from the first case, and it's possible. It, it's a possibility. Another example is the following. Let Q1 be the following polynomial. So here we have two linear functions so such that Q1 and Q2 are in their ideal. So let X and Y be those linear functions. So let Q1 be X times A plus Y times B, and Q2 be X times C plus Y times C. Now, if Q1 and Q2 vanish, then think about it. It's like, it's like taking the matrix A, B, C, D times the vector X, Y, right? And Q1 is the first coordinate and Q2 is the second coordinate. So if this multiplication results in the zero vector, then either the determinant is zero, or if the determinant is not zero, then both X and Y must be zero, and therefore the sum is zero. So that's another example. And again, it's not how to see that this example is not captured by uh, the first case, nor by the second case. So it's a, again, it's a, it's a third possibility that can happen. And what the theorem says, basically, that these are the only possibilities uh, for such a structure. So that for some product of product polynomials to be in the radical of the ideal generated by two other quadratics. Okay, so that's a uh, first tool. And uh, so she and I gave an element a very quite elementary proof of this theorem, and uh, there are more sophisticated uh, to, uh, proofs using the uh, tools from algebraic geometry that gives you actually stronger results that uh, classify when this ideal that generated by Q1 and Q2 is prime or radical, uh, etc. What we showed basically is that if we look at the result of, result of Q1 and Q2 with respect to some variable, and if you look at the factorization of this result, then then basically the different cases correspond to different ways in which the resultant factorizes, whether it's irreducible, whether it has two linear, two quadratic, irreducible quadratic factors, whether it is linear factors, more or less. Okay, so that's the idea of the, how we prove this uh, theorem. The second tool that we needed uh, for the proof of this, uh, uh, of this third result of this colorful of this colorful version, and also for the, this result was uh, an analog of the robust version of this edelstein theorem. So the edelstein theorem is the colorful version of the Sylvester Delight theorem, and we needed a, a, a combinatorial, a robust combinatorial version that was not captured by uh, earlier results. So just recall that this is the colorful version that if we have points and every monochromatic line passes that every non-monochromatic line oh, this one is, uh, contains all three colors and the dimension of the prime is small. Then we need uh, the following uh, result for a uh, uh, following robust version that uh, if every point in one set spans, you know, is containing in uh, delta special lines, in delta fraction of special lines, then the dimension is small. So we were able to prove a one over delta cube down. We didn't try to improve it. This is probably not tight. And I mean, probably the correct bound is one over delta, but for our needs, it was sufficient. But actually that's an interesting problem. Just improve it to one over delta. I don't think it should be very difficult. No, I mean, I don't know how to do it, but I don't think it's like a very difficult problem. Um, okay, so that's the second tool that we needed. And the way that we combine this tool I'm just going to make very few words about it because uh, it's just the, it's the technical theorem. Uh, basically, we prove the following. We use the structured theorem that argue that either, well, think about any of the settings, right? That we either that argue, okay, so we have a set of quadratic polynomials that satisfy these vanishing conditions. And what we showed is that if you consider the coefficient vectors of the quadratic polynomials, then Either these coefficient vectors, if you think about them as vectors in R to the n square, roughly, then either these vectors satisfy the robust, you know, either Sylvester Galea or Edelstein Kelly theorem, or if they don't satisfy this, then basically you can prove that each quadratic polynomial is actually depends on a few linear functions. So as a quadratic function, its rank is constant. And now if you collect all these uh, linear functions, or we take a basis for each polynomial, so you get a collection of linear functions, then, then we prove that these linear functions must satisfy the conditions of the robust either Sylvester Galea or Adoshin Kelly theorems. 
So in either, either cases, all the polynomials, either they live in a constant dimensional space or they depend on constantly many linear functions, which again imply the result. And the way we show it, it's quite technical. We have to do a lot of uh, case analysis. And the intuition is basically that by the structure theorem, uh, if a polynomial Q belongs to many special lines, right, if you know, with many QI and QJ, there is a QK, then Q must have structure, right? Either QI and QJ spend a, a third polynomial, right? This was the first case in the structure theorem, or Q1 and Q2 uh, are very close to each other, right? Either they spend a product of, linear fun of two linear functions or they belong to a two dimensional idea, right? So in, any, in either cases, they, we get the Q is very close to some other polynomials, so uh, it depends on very few linear functions. And again, as I said, it's a lot of case analysis uh, because we have to study a few different cases and you know break the set into which polynomials satisfy which case with a lot of other polynomials. And that leads to a lot of case analysis. But that's all I'm going to say about the proof. Okay, so I don't think it was very informative, but that's a very, very high level what's going on uh, in the proof. Okay, so let me end this talk by uh, speaking about uh, some open problems. And that will be a good opportunity to speak about the conjecture of uh, Ankit Gupta. So, Ankit, so remember that I mentioned two conjectures, the first by Bikram, Mitman, and Saxena, and the other by Gupta that spoke about depth for identities. But actually, Gupta made conjectures that just generalized uh, the Sylvester Gray theorem to polynomials of higher degrees. And this was the motivation for our work, uh, actually. So uh, the first conjecture that Antut made was the following. Um, consider a set of uh, degree D polynomials that satisfy the property that we already discussed. If whenever two of them vanish, then the product vanishes. Then the conjecture was that the algebraic crank must be some constant that only depends on D. OK, so this conjecture, uh, OK. Um, Right now it's open, but it, it's, it's been sold, but still not published. But uh, that's a very interesting result. So this speaks about the case that we have one set and the number of two polynomials in the set finish the product with all the other polynomial functions. Another conjecture is the following where we have many sets of polynomials, right? Just imagine now that we have k sets, f1, f2, up to fk, k sets of the greedy polynomials. And they have the property that whenever we pick K minus one polynom polynomials from K minus one different sets, then any common zero of them is also a zero of some polynomial in the K set. Okay, so that whenever you know you have polynomials from the first K minus one sets and, and, and take a common zero of them, then it's also a zero of some other some polynomial in the K set. Then in this case two, the algebraic point is bounded by some constant depending only on the degree of the basic polynomials and the number of sets, but not on the number of variables, not on the size of the sets fi. Okay, and of course, if you solve this uh, conjecture, then you get uh, polynomial polynomial time polynomial identity testing algorithms for a class of circuits. That right now, uh, we don't have any polynomial time algorithm for the class. Okay, but regardless, if you care about Algorithms for polynomial identity testing or not, I think that just as an algebraic question, it's a very interesting and elegant question. Um, okay. Sorry. So, this is a conjecture related to the algebraic version of algebraic or of Sylvester Gallai theorem. Or well, this one is the colorful version. But let me speak about some other set of conjecture that uh, is more. You can think about it as more being related to the combinatorial points versus design problem, which is the following. Given of Weissman and Wilson 48 says the following that if we have a finite set of points in R squared that is not contained in a conic, then there's a conic that contains exactly five points of A. Okay, so let's rephrase the Sylvester Gallic theorem. If we have a finite set of points that is not contained in a line, then there's a line that contains exactly two points from the set. Right, so you need five points to define the conic, and you need two points to define the line. Right, so this is the, uh, the different generalization of the Sylvester-Gallai theorem. And here's a, an open problem. 
let's say that you have a finite set of points in R2, it is not contained in a curve of the grid D. Right? There's not a grid D curve that you know, interpolates through all the points, that passes through all the points. Then the conjecture is that there's a curve of the grid D that contains exactly this many points. And again, you know, it's a trivial calculation to show that this is the number of points that you need to, in order to uh, uh, specify such a curve. Okay, so this is a, this is not an algebraic conjecture. It's not related to polynomial identity testing, but again, I think it's a very elegant, intriguing, uh, open problem that's related to everything that uh, we spoke about uh, today. Okay, so for, to conclude, we saw applications to not locally coactable codes, but to algebraic identities and program testing, and some generalization to algebraic geometry questions uh, that are also relevant to, you know, testing identities. And as I said, uh, you know, many open problems, a lot is not, not known. And I think that's you know, a beautiful set of uh, questions that combines combinatorics, algebra, algebraic geometry, computer science, and I think it's, again, you know, it's a, just a beautiful topic. Uh, okay, so I think I'm just in time. So thank you. And uh, I'll take questions if you have any.